Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Beer Ladies podcast. I am Tandy, and I'm joined today by Lisa and Christina. And we are going to try something new again on the pod because we do tend to do these every now and then. We are going to do effectively a mock BJCP evaluation of a particular style of beer. Uh, Lisa and myself have got two different kinds of American IPA, West Coast IPA, and we're going to go through what it's like to actually judge a beer like this in a competition. So we're going to go through the score sheet and we'll go through all the different bits and bobs of um, what, what makes a good score sheet and how you would rate and how you would perceive all the different flavors and aromas and, and things within the this, this style. And if this episode goes well, maybe we'll even make a bit of a series of it where we do mock BJCP valuations of you know, other styles too. It doesn't just have to be IPAs. And so, yeah, tell us if you like it. So welcome, Lisa, Christina. Hello. And what we'll do is we'll do what you're drinking, but first a quick social media and links update. Guys, everything that you can find on us is at beerladiespodcast.com, including all of the links to our socials, including Twitter and Mastodon and Instagram and Facebook and yeah everywhere uh, there's also links there to buy merch there's also links to buy us a beer if you so choose so we do love a support and if you're watching on youtube press a like button or a subscribe button or a notification bell so that you don't miss stuff and if you're on your podcast player do subscribe if you haven't already that way it's in your download queue ready and waiting every friday all right so we've chosen to do an american ipa today lisa which ipa are you going to be doing today I have the Hope West Coast IPA. This is their limited edition number 30. Had to look for that. And I'm really looking forward to trying this one. I had their My Bach recently, obviously would not be uh, appropriate for this particular one, but, um, and I've just cracked it open and we won't go into sort of how it tastes yet, but I am uh, excited about uh, just seeing it again. If we were in a real competition, we wouldn't have all this information at our fingertips, but I'm looking at, you know, bitterness, 75 IBU, because they've got this on mm. the side of the can, loving that. And I was like, oh, that's that's like proper West Coast IPA if we're in that kind of ballpark. Because I was thinking even like Stone, that's about 70, they, thereabouts. And a lot of the ones that are, you know, your standard commercial styles, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that, are kind of 60-ish, 70-ish. Mm. So I'm like, 75, that's... That's bold. Looking forward to that. So I have not tasted it yet, but I did pour it. And it is this mm -hmm. lovely, lovely color. And again, they even give you the color on the side of the can. But it is to me just this kind of lovely amber, kind of a deep amber color. And it had an amazing frothy head at first, but I've, I've let that uh, go now. But we'll, we'll break all this down some more. But I just wanted to pour it out, see what it looks like. And I'm going to sit here and sniff it for a while while we talk about what you've got. Awesome. Um, and the one that I've chosen today is by Western Herd. And it is called Irish Wolfhound IPA. It's got such a cool can. It's this lovely illustration of an Irish Wolfhound in like a suit <laughs> drinking a beer. That. It's very cute. I love that. Yeah. And as Lisa said, not all of this information would be available to us if we were actually judging. But what I do notice on this one, which is interesting, is that it is unbeknownst to me when I bought it, 10.5% alcohol. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just so make we, it funny. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can talk about whether that fits or not into American IPA style guide. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through that. But probably a friendly reminder that breweries do not necessarily brew for BJCP style guidelines. You know, they're trying to sell beer, not win beer competitions or at least BJCP competitions. So... A little bit of grace is always given <laughs> to commercial yeah, yeah. breweries. Yeah. Um, however, if I'd seen the ABV, I might not have chosen this one, but it's okay. <laughs> I would drink it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Christina, I'm going to hand over to you since you are not drinking tonight and are going to be leading our judging yes. exercise. I'm the moderator, as it were. Keeping us in check. Yes. Yes. So we're going to base this off the BJCP score sheet, and we're just going to go right down the side. So when you're evaluating a beer for the BJCP, you're going to be looking for several different categories. So the first that we're going to tackle, I'm not going to tell you what all of them are right up front because it might be a little overwhelming. So the first that we're going to tackle is aroma. So while they're 
Andy and Lisa are smelling their beers away. I'm going like to normal you- people, like normal people. <laughs> What the kind of things that you might be looking for when you're looking or trying to assess the aroma. So you might be thinking about what sort of malt notes you get. So is it grainy? Does it taste like, or does it smell like bread? What kind of notes there? Is there a caramel? Anything like that? Coffee notes, perhaps from a darker roast. These are the sorts of things that you might want to think about when you're sort of gauging the aroma. You might also consider hops. So are they, you know, earthy hops? Are they herbal hops? Are you getting some kind of fruit notes? What kind of fruit are you finding in your beer? Um, And with the fruity notes, we can also talk about esters. So are you having anything sort of raisiny, something that might come from a yeast, something, you know, or even even pepper, clove, these sorts of things. Do you, do you get any of those notes in the smell? And then any other things that you might find, any other sort of aromatic, any other things that are coming up. And you might want to consider um, smelling your beer initially when it's first poured or when it's first handed to you, and then coming back later and checking again and seeing if those smells are still there or if they dissipated or you notice something completely different. So that's an introduction to aroma um, if you're not familiar. And so I will leave it to Tandy and Lisa to tell us what they are actually smelling. Mm. You go first, Lisa. Sure. So this is actually very interesting to me because it is, it is very much like, you know, as soon as I opened it, I got this very kind of nostalgic to me hit of like these very sort of piney, you know, almost sort of, you know, resinous kind of hoppiness. Like, you know, I I think it's very easy if you're, if you don't do this all the time, you're just like, oh, it smells hoppy or, you know, and then one of the goals here is to break down, well, what, what kind of hoppiness and, you know, is that really all you get? But I do also get a lot of this kind of sweetness kind of too, which um, again, to me, I, I like that kind of sticky malt sweetness that you get in some IPA or especially some West coast IPAs. Um, and I know we're going to get on to, to appearance in a minute, but I'm just like, I'm so excited I can see through it, but we'll, we'll get on to that though uh, a little bit later, but it, it's definitely giving me that kind of, you know, sticky piney, and these are all good things to me, sticky piney kind of aromas and that kind of, um, that kind of sweetness, not like a caramel sort of smell, but it's, it's really definitely the, um, you know, that, that sort of piney resin uh, kind of aroma is the thing that's really leading. And I'm excited about that because that says good things to me. But the fact that I'm also getting that sort of hint of sweetness in the background also suggests that this is not going to be just getting walloped over the head with nothing but bitterness. This should be, this should be pretty complex. So fingers crossed, haven't tasted it yet, but so far the, uh, the signs are good. So. Mm. So I'll sound, I mean, fairly similar. I've got sort of high, high hop aromas. I've put down sort of resiny, earthy, I've got some sort of earthy notes in here. And for me, that just means it, you know, it doesn't smell like floral or rosy yeah. or, or jasmine or anything like that. And it doesn't necessarily smell tropical. You know, you're not getting pineapple or guava or papaya. Um, you're getting something almost I mean, we've spoken about dank before, right? You get a little yeah. bit of something dank almost in here, which tells me there's a little bit of pine resin earthy kind of hops in in this one um i'm not getting a huge amount of malt aromas i would have almost expected a something to indicate that there's going to be a bit of a malt backbone so a caramel or something in there but i do get some alcohol warmth so oh i you bet know, you do from i do that, it's yeah. a 10 and a half percent beer so that's expected from this particular beer now i wouldn't say that that's expected in a standard american ipa you wouldn't necessarily get that i don't um restrained alcohol you'd you'd, mm-hmm. you'd find in a typical one yeah this one well it's there it's there yeah. we'll decide I, later as to whether it's restrained whether it dissipates a bit and i and i think this is one of those things that can really help you know set apart that you know that that american west coast from like your, your english ipas because i feel like they do have that sort of grassy hop aroma that you just don't get in these for the most part it's it's really distinctive when you do have that so I, I actually love to taste an English style an American style and I'm putting style in because obviously we're drinking Irish beers but American style in this case um you know back to back because they you do really then get that difference in aroma and it's it's nice to sort of 
you, you know, compare contrast when they're right next to each other, because that can also help you say, oh, is this miscategorized? But we'll, we will get mm. onto that kind of thing later Indeed. because, you know, something may be lovely, but in the wrong category. So, yeah. And then sometimes it's useful to talk about what you don't perceive, you yeah. know, when you're talking about a particular category. So in this case, you know, I'm not really perceiving anything estuary. So none of the sort of fruitiness that comes from fermentation or from yeast. And I'm not perceiving anything phenolic, which is another sort of common yeast byproduct. So whereas those you'd expect to see in other styles like bias or saison, I don't get them here. So that is a good thing for the style. Yeah, I agree. Same here. Not, none of that. And and sometimes you do get that, especially like in in homebrewed examples where it, it doesn't, you know, it's technically wrong in air quotes, but sometimes it's still good. Other times it, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you, you start to add up those faults and it's it's too many, mm. but uh, none of that here. So, mm. but one fault does not necessarily throw something out. And I think that's important. You can have a real spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So do we want to move on to that? appearance? Mm, right. So, so the one thing I want to mention before we get too far on is that this is not um, closed book. It's open book. So that means when you are judging and actually in real life, you can have your color scale. You can have the, you know, the BJCP guidelines open to you and you'll have the score sheet as well, which can help guide you. So don't, um, if you're not familiar with BJCP judging and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, how do I memorize all this? You don't. You, well, you have to yeah. for the test. You do for the then test. never again. <laughs> yeah, but never in real life. It's like yeah. the leaving cert. You memorize all this stuff, even though in real life you would never do that yeah. this way. So just, yeah. yeah. We, we all remember <clears throat> taking our exams <laughs> and having to memorize it all. But um, after, you know, I took mine years ago and I absolutely pull up all my guidelines and stuff when I when I do yeah. judge now so absolutely and usually when you are judging like you've got everything that's kind of printed out or you've got it on your phone mm -hmm. next to you like, because sometimes too like even if it is in your head you want to look something up and be like oh is this still a thing because you might get something that used to be more common and now is less so it's like these things do evolve and change over time so sometimes, sometimes you have to like look it up and be like oh no that's still okay so yeah um, mm -hmm. definitely evolution there yeah. And when you're judging, the focus should be on what you're actually perceiving and not this like, oh my gosh, what have I memorized? Like you're yeah. there to help the people yes. that you're judging the beers for. You're there to give proper feedback to help them improve their beers or tell the beers are amazing or whatever. So memorization of this stuff is not necessarily effective to to do mm -hmm. the job that you're there to to do. Definitely. So don't worry if, if all of this seems like a lot, because mm -hmm. I remember and it is a lot. Um, but yeah, so we're going to move on to appearance. So the first thing is the color. What color is your beer? Is it something really light and straw or is it all the way dark, like a porter or a stout? And if it's darker um, or anything at all, you can actually take the light on your phone and shine it up underneath of the beer and see if there's something we call highlights. So sometimes with your porters and your stouts, you might have ruby highlights or something like that. And that's important to note. So do make sure to, to check for those things. Also clarity. Is it clear? Can you see through it? Is it like water or is it thicker? Is it hazy like a New England IPA or something like that, you know, where it just looks almost opaque even, sometimes even like juice sometimes. Um, I've definitely had beers that look almost like juice. So you know, and, and just because the beer is darker doesn't necessarily mean it's as opaque as that. So just, you know, those are things to keep in mind um, that the color and the clarity are different because um, that was something sometimes I automatically, oh, when I was first starting, oh, it's darker. So it must be this, but, you know, again, with those highlights and things like that, there's all those kind of things to kind of look out for. Yeah, Another thing to consider is head. So the, the, the bubbles at the top. So are there, are there a lot of them are, and when it initially poured, so when you initially got the beer, where was the head like? And now that the beer has sat for a while, what have, what are the changes that you saw? Does the, has the head dropped? Is it the same? Are there bigger bubbles? Are there tight bubbles? What is happening there? And it's just some things to just note down to kind of watch the beer as you go on. So like the aroma, it's something you might want to circle back to later on to see just where that head has moved. Mm. And 
we've I think we've already mentioned this, but you know, when we're evaluating beers in a BJCP competition, we're not deciding whether we like this beer yeah. or whether we would drink this beer on any given day. You know, we're judging this beer against the style it was entered into. And that's the only criteria. So in a case where you love a beer, but it's been entered into the wrong category, or you dislike the beer itself, but it scores really highly in the BJCP, these, these are all possibilities. So when yep. we're talking about evaluating or judging a beer against the BJCP, it is how well does it match the guidelines? That's yeah. really it. So yeah, it's important to put down what you what you perceive, whether it's aroma flavors and whatnot, and then check against them, see whether it falls within the parameters of that exact style. Um, and head was a lovely one because different beer styles have got different levels of head retention and different kind of characteristics of head. You know, some are frothy and, and loose and others are very dense and creamy. You know, the difference between a Guinness and a lager, let's say. Um, those are all parts of the style. Yeah, and like I've definitely judged beer styles that aren't my favorite um, but it's it's trying to be as objective as you can to evaluate a beer which is hard because beer drinking is such a subjective experience you know depends on as we talked about before where you are who you're with um, if you're eating something all these other things and so this tries to objectively create criteria for evaluating a beer but absolutely you can get a beer in a category that's just amazing but it's just wrong to style and then you have to mark that down because you're marking it, as Tandy said, against this criteria. So that is something to keep in mind for BJCP evaluation versus you perhaps making your own style um, evaluations for yourself, which might just be more of, you know, just declaring what these things are and then figuring out if you personally like it, um, which, of course, many of us do with our little notebooks or used to at some point in time with our little notebooks and or our untapped or whatever it is that we use to evaluate for ourselves, whether we like something or not, which is, you know, quite different. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to note, too, like since we are doing IPAs, another reason I think we wanted to make sure we were doing local ones, too, is because they really can suffer in transit um just mm. you know the you, you want it to be kind of if you can to have it as close as possible to where you you know where it was made you know a bit about the cold chain because that hop you know that that hop aroma and that 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 hop character really does dissipate even if it's in the best can in the world after a while it's just not going to have that same punch so it's really nice to be doing you know or evaluating local ones mm. because then you get that mm. that freshness and it really does make a difference it doesn't mean you can't have a great beer but uh, you know, I think, you know, people get very invested in chasing kind of your, you know, your, your Russian river beers or, you know, whatever, but if it's not as fresh, it, it's not going to yeah. travel well, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. So another reason to drink local. Yeah. It's also another reason why on the BJCP score sheet, um, aroma is before appearance, even mm. though you're really looking at the beer first, but what you're actually doing immediately when you judge is giving it a smell and giving it a sniff because a lot of these um, um, volatile and they dissipate, you know, so if you leave exactly. them wrong, if you're only, um, if you're really trying to evaluate whether this is slightly hazy or very hazy, you'll miss some of the lovely aromas. So yep. that's why that's first on the, on the uh, score sheet. Yeah, good point. Right. So should we talk about your appearance then, Lisa? Mm. Sure. So again, we've got this lovely deep amber color, almost a, almost the kind of, uh, and I know they have different grades now, but almost like a maple syrup kind of a, of a color, um, but, you know, sort of deep gold, deep amber. Um, and, and again, like it almost kind of, I think because of that amber color can also sort of psychologically put you in mind of like that kind of resinous sort of thing. So again, it's really important that, you know, the flavor when we get to that comes from the aroma comes from how it looks, you're getting all these cues. So you are going to be influenced whether you want to be or not by what it looks like, but uh, some of the head is gone now, but it had quite a nice, like white fluffy head for a while and it had good head retention. That's a, that's a thing. Um, but yeah, definitely less of it now because it's been sitting for a bit, but it does, it is still kind of on the glass. You do get a little bit of the, the lacing as well. And I'm going to check that again after we, we take a couple of sips, but definitely lovely color, clear as can be. So very, again, excited about that. Um, you know, no haze here, no, not just, you know, not hazy, no chill haze either. I know we talked about that uh, the other week, but 
very excited that this is the color it should be and the clarity it should be because you know we don't uh, we don't always see that and I, I think we we've, we've already called out something that was labeled as a hazy west coast IPA the other day and again we're going to say no don't no no, no anyway. to that <laughs> all right so mine is a similar color to yours Lisa although my lighting if anyone's watching doesn't yeah. quite allow for it to look the same same it is it's that it's that sort of um deep deep um amber almost copper color mine is a lot hazier than yours so this one is actually quite hazy you can't see through the glass so it's not opaque yeah. you know as opaque as a stout would be um or even a vice beer but it is very hazy now within the guideline um some haze light haze is acceptable for this style but it shouldn't be i would say this hazy for an american ipa so that's just one note there. But on the head, it also, it did pour a lovely sort of quite a fluffy white head, but it dissipated fairly quickly. And I've got a sort of a minimal line around there where it's staying, uh, not, yeah, not unexpected. Absolutely. Okay, so okay. now probably what most of us like the most about a beer, which would be the flavor. So um, kind of work, I'm just going to start with, it's just very similar to what you're looking for in the aroma. So what are those malt notes? Is it grainy? Is it bready? Is it caramel? Is it honey? What are you picking up that might be coming from any number of different malt roasts that might go into the beer? Now, importantly, does this follow the aroma? So were you teased by, you know, grainy notes? And then in the flavor, that's just not there. That's something to make note of. Or maybe it is there. Also something to make note of. Same thing with the hops. Is it resinous? Is it earthy? Is it herbal? What did it say on the aroma? And is it in the flavor? Or did you not get anything on the aroma, but now it's present in the flavor? That's also something to consider writing not consider, something you should write <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're evaluating beers, BJCP style. Um, the same thing with the esters, as we talked about, is it phenolic? Those sorts of things. Um, are there any off flavors? So there's, you know, things that shouldn't be there in any style of beer. Um, is it, does it taste metallic? anything like that, which you might've noted in the aroma or you might not have, it might just be in the flavor. So just make notes of all of the things that you are literally tasting in your mouth. What do you taste? And then compare that to what should you taste mm. and see what's missing or what's there. And does it follow the aroma? Like do these things all go together? That's how I typically evaluate mine. So what are you all tasting and do you agree or do you do it a bit differently? Yeah, I mean, I agree. When when I'm when I am uh, tasting and judging, I like to write down sort of in sequence what I'm tasting first, second, mm. third. You know, yeah. so it's it's, mm. and often I just try and keep in my head. But it is also there on the score sheet to help guide. You know, if you're looking for if you're looking for hop flavor, hop bitterness, malts, esters, um, and the finish. You know, you often want to know whether the finish is dry or sweet or whether it yeah. lingers. Um, and not go too much into mouthfeel because we'll get there. But um, that, so I try to keep those sort of um, metrics or rubrics, I guess, in in mind. But I try and describe it exactly the way that I'm tasting it. Um, and yeah. then important to quantify it as well. You know, yes. it's it's, hmm. it's yeah. sort of not good enough to say, oh, this is hoppy and it tastes grassy or whatever the case is. You know, you want to say whether it's a low, medium or high hoppy bitterness or hoppy flavor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that really helps to, um, it really helps to describe the beer better. You know, somebody yes. gave me advice once where it was describe the flavor as if you were, you know, you know, telling somebody what it tastes like, tell them what they could expect to drink from it. Um, as opposed to, I like this flavor. It's not about right. that. Yeah. No. And, and also like the balance, is it balanced to the malt? Mm. Is it balanced to the hops or is it pretty equal? I think that's also something that I find really valuable in these sorts mm. of things. Just where where are we leaning and like you said with the finish what are you kind of getting at the end or is there an aftertaste these sorts of things are also important yeah absolutely, absolutely. 
Yeah, and you're right. And it can be such a, a continuum of things that you taste, but I like your idea of putting it in, in order because again, like because you're smelling it as you're about to taste it, you should be getting, you know, that that hop, you know, again, that those hops should kind of hit you over the head, but it shouldn't be the only thing you're tasting, but that should be kind of one of the first things in this style. That's not going to be true of every style, but because they are so prominent, you should get that right away. And I do, I do definitely get that. But what's interesting to me in this one is I, I get that, again, that kind of very, I'll say kind of green, you know, hoppiness, but it's, it tastes much more, I would say, um, hmm, I'm trying to think how to describe it. I get much more of that sort of piney, I'll, I'll call it California hoppiness versus in the Pacific Northwest. And this is my own like weird thing in my head. You get much more of that resinous sort of sticky. And I find more of it, you know, as you get further north. I'm not getting as much of that resinous sticky. I'm getting more of sort of California, slightly softer, if, if you like, um, kind of hoppiness. Um, I know it's all still kind of the same hops, but it's just a little bit of a different character for me. But then, yeah, at the same time, then I do get that that really nice kind of bready, almost sort of toasted grain maltiness. So it the two of them really work together. The thing that surprises me a little bit is, again, I, I kind of almost like it to be a little bit more sticky, if you like. That's, again, personal preference because I tend to like my Pacific Northwest west coast so i'm being very you know sort of picky here but what i do love is this has a really nice sort of light astringency on the finish so it finishes quite dry you get that bitterness but i i still wonder you know if i i think if it didn't tell me on the can that it was 75 ibus i don't know that i would pick up on that because it's not like some of those back in the both abv and ibu wars where you were just absolutely pummeled over the head with that kind of hot bitterness i'm not getting that and I don't know if I'm missing that um, or if I'm missing that, if that makes sense. So I, I don't know whether I'm like, like my brain wants it to be there and it's not there or if it is there and I'm just not perceiving it because I haven't had as much of it lately. So it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. This is why you have multiple tastes. You can go back and think about these things, but first impressions mm -hmm. are, you know, I, I, I really love it all together, but I'm, I'm not getting that kind of punch, if you like. Now, that may be quite different in yours, Tandy, since it's a little mm. stronger. But yes, this this one is a big boy. Um, so I've written down here that I've got initially high hop flavors, and what I've put down is they they remind me of marmalade and resin. So mm. I'm getting that sort of sticky orangey almost um, flavor, and then I've said almost immediately followed by a moderate to high caramel brulee note. I think mm. there's something in it that makes me think of a brulee, you know, that just slightly crackled sugar as opposed to just a caramel. Um, so it's got almost a little bit of a burnt sugar um, taste to it, which I think is interesting. Um, but it doesn't finish that way. It finishes quite dry, um, which is quite a feat, you know, yeah, to get that, right. and that sweetness not to not to linger, because the finish leans more towards the bitterness, uh, definitely. So it must be well attenuated, you know, with that, um, with that finish. Uh, yeah, aftertaste is bitter. There is um, some alcohol warmth, but actually not nearly as much as oh. what the aroma led me to believe. So that's kind of interesting, too. So that one's a bit deceptive, uh, which of you hmm. probably wanted that strength. But then sometimes you don't want it that strength, depending on what you're mm. what you're going for. That's interesting, though. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 definitely it's not uh, too sweet. You know, I remember yeah back in the old West Coast IPAs often had quite a bit of sweetness to them, and I think it wasn't so much sweetness, or maybe I just couldn't articulate that it was that sort of malty, caramelly um, backbone, but sometimes they finished with a sweetness and bitterness, yeah. and this one, I'd find, doesn't have that sweet finish, which is pleasant to me, and I think that that fits the style pretty well. You know, within the style, you need to be able to have it moderately dry to a dry finish, so that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, that's something I know we talked about this with many different people at nationals, like is a West Coast IPA still what a West Coast IPA used to be like before all the hazies turned up and everyone got used to everything being like 30 IBUs instead of, mm. you know, 70 some odd IBUs. And, and I'm wondering now, though, 
Like, is it just about that that bitterness? And and I guess we should say too, for people who are not like doing this all, all the time, your your IBUs are your bittering units and how the how you're looking at that on, on the scale. But you know, there's there is this thing too where it's because we just don't see them as much now, do we perceive it differently? Or are we kind of, if you like, misremembering? And of course, memory is this very sort of faulty thing. Am I remembering how they all were differently? Like I probably am. So because it's like you say, it's always still going to be subjective but um at, at the same time it's it's interesting where i'm like oh yes this, this takes me back loving what i'm tasting here but at the same time i'm like am i missing that one little extra punch because it was really there or because my brain has decided it should be there and so that's that's one of those things where you have to kind of you know figure out again go back to the style and that's why it's always worth going back and saying well was this there is this all right is this good and, and again it's a lovely beer but i'm, I'm still wondering like what's that what's that little extra mm, mm. was it just around the yeah. um that sweetness I think you mentioned because I know a lot of the especially Californian ones I would say did have that very sweet malt backbone back in the day uh, which probably they shouldn't have but they did um and as we said before like you, you know as a professional brewer you don't have to brew to the style guidelines you can say whatever tastes good to you and this is a gorgeous beer so you know Richie and team well done um but yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, is is it just in my head that I should just be getting this extra little little mm -hmm. kick of bitterness that's not there? But I love how this finishes again, that that nice, dry, slightly astringent finish, which is absolutely bang on. So yeah. But again, very different when you're looking at that kind of um strength that you've got. Mm, indeed. Um, but we'll get, you know, we'll get to overall impressions after oh, yeah. mouthfeel because there'll be comments um yes. but, yeah de but but definitely because it's higher it'll have a different profile and sometimes um have you guys found in competitions do i don't know if my last one that i judged whether the abv was given to us as part of the um as part of the bottle because guys what happens normally at beer competitions is that you get a bottle it's anonymized so you yeah. don't know who the brewer is you know which style it's been entered into um, and you might have some notes so that optionally brewers can add in notes about you know if they've used a special ingredient or you know fermented on some sort of fruit or something um, but you know buyer beware or caution to brewers because if yeah. you put those notes in judges expect to be able to taste that so yeah. that's why people often leave those things blank but when you're judging you're not often given things like the ABV, you're definitely yeah. not given the color, the SRM or the IBUs, you know, these are things that you have to deduce and yeah. then figure out whether they fit that style. Um, yeah, because yeah. like you say, it's such a hard thing to figure out at, at home, like what you know what you should be getting based on your, you know, original gravity and what you were trying to do, but things can, things can happen and things can go in all sorts of different directions. And, and I know I've certainly judged things where you get that that wham of oh this is much stronger than I was expecting and and you know often that then is perceived as kind of like crazy sweetness or or that kind of thing or just you know in like we say moving into mouthfeel that kind of heaviness where it might not be appropriate for the style but uh, mm -hmm. it's it, that's the thing is you have to tease it out in so many different ways when you're judging because like you say it's not just not just there on the can because it's hard to figure out at home exactly what you did like you can get in the ballpark but you're never going to be bang on like when you have proper equipment. Yeah, for sure. Did we want to move on to mouthfeel? Let's do it. Mouthfeel is exactly what it says on the tin. It's how the beer feels in your mouth. So is it like water or is it more like milk? What is the body <laughs> of the beer? What does it feel like? Is it, speaking of milk, is it creamy? Do you have that alcohol warmth? So if it's a higher ABV something, do you have that kind of warm feeling in your mouth? Or is it even hot? Is it just way, you know, very strong? Let's talk about carbonation. Again, is it water yeah. or is it sparkling water? Is it soda? What kind of bubbles are you getting in your mouth? Is it, you know, is there a party or is it kind of chill? <laughs> So these kinds of things, or is it astringent? So sometimes, especially, you know, you're talking about darker malts, are you getting sort of that astringent, stringency 
in mm. the feeling in your mouth and anything else that you might be getting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a funny thing just because I, I hadn't had a Guinness in a long time and I had a couple over the weekend and, it, you know, I feel like for, for the uninitiated, you know, you can kind of forget how relatively, even though it's very creamy, how thin a Guinness is compared to a lot of mm -hmm. other styles, because I have something like this. And of course you look at it, it doesn't look like a thick, creamy kind of thing. And it's not, but it, the mouth feels still more, I'll say substantial in a lot of ways than a Guinness would be like, it's, it's what we would call, you know, in BJCP terms sort of medium, then that's exactly where you want it to be because you've got all these, you know, it's, 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 exa it's exactly where it should be. But I think, you know, again, your point around like, is it bubbly? Is it like all these things, you know, it's certainly not as carbonated as something like a Saison might be where there's like often all sorts happening, but, um, but, but again, that would be weird in this style. We wouldn't want that, but it, it, it is interesting to me how, um, again, how different something that, you know, someone may perceive something as dark and heavy, you know, when that's not what it is at all, really, it's much more sort of light and creamy, but still light, whereas this has a much more, you know, again, substantial body to it. So, and again, I, I love the word mouthfeel because it's so nerdy and just so like, you, you know, in the weeds, but it, it really does, you know, help you go in a direction in terms of how do you describe something. So Tammy, I'm, I'm curious about yours, because I feel like yeah. that yours must be kind of a chewier kind of a thing but maybe not it's I've put it in as a medium body I actually thought it oh. might be a little more chewy based on the strength but no. they've done quite well to keep it very drinkable um, oh interesting however the carbonation is quite low so sure. you know that could help or it could not help you know I I tend to think that a slightly higher carbonation can sometimes lift a sort of heavier chewier mouthfeel and make it you know spritzier and lighter in this case the lack of carbonation I, I feel helps make it seem thicker um, and more chewy so that that is the way that I think of it but for the rest of the mouthfeel uh, yeah I've said a dry finish and I've got some low alcohol warmth which again I think is I mean appropriate for the um, amount of alcohol, not necessarily for the style that it purports to be, but that's that's what I'm tasting. So some warmth, not a lot though. You know, again, I feel like the aroma was giving me uh, high alcohol strength, but it's it's very well done in the sense that I don't mm. taste and feel it as much as I could smell it. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I I've got one a can of that in my fridge too, and I was sort of like, oh, once I saw that it was ten percent, I was like, oh, I better save this to be a dessert beer. But now you're telling me you're not getting that kind of sweetness from it, so maybe I need to just mm. find the the right food pairing. So mm. but we'll, we'll get onto that though as a sort of side point. But yeah, I, I think like the dry finish in this is really important because and and again, dry finish. You know, I'm saying slightly astringent, but not in a bad way because you can certainly go too far in that direction. But I feel like this is just like just enough where you're like, oh, it's it's good. It doesn't have that sort of super sweet or sort of sickly kind of character to it. But finish is dry because like we were saying, some of the ones back in the day had quite a sweet finish, not just from that malt backbone, but also the finish would then kind of leave you thinking, I only want this much of this. Like, mm. um, especially some of those, like I'm thinking of some of like, it's a reason I don't love Pliny the Younger. Uh, and I know people seek this beer out and it's a lovely beer. That's, I'm not, I'm not dissing Pliny the Younger, but to me, it's so sweet because of that high alcohol and because of like all those other things that go in there that I'm happy to have a small glass of it, but I wouldn't want like, you know, here, like a full can of it, it would just be too much. Whereas Pliny the Elder, I can have, you know, roughly this size of it, even though it's very strong because it finishes drier uh, because it's got this interesting balance even though we know balance is probably the wrong word there but but again I think back to this beer um, it's just got this really nice really nice mouthfeel so just right for the style mm. I think with any of these you know whether it was um, an American IPA proper as in a west coast or whether we're heading in towards sort of double triple IPA yeah. territory like in mine um depending on the hops that they've used, but often because they're sort of piney, resiny sort of hops as opposed to tropical fruity hops, they, they can sometimes be in the mouthfeel that sort of slickness to yeah. your tongue, you know, that almost sticks to your tongue. And that's just, it's like a hop oil in a sense that coats it. It's not the same as something like diacetyl, which mm -hmm. comes across as buttery or popcorn or butterscotch. It's not that flavor. It's, it's like a hop resin. 
Um, so I feel like the more you drink this, the more sort of of that you get, but you can't deny in this case, the finish is dry, but it is bitter. So it does stick, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, and you know what's interesting? It's interesting you say that because I'm looking again at the can, which we would not have this detail in a judging situation, mm. but knowing that you have, you know, all four sea hops, Cascade, Columbus, Centennial, and Chinook, um, I, I do wonder if that's the bit of missing I'm not getting that stickiness from the resin, which again, mm. doesn't have to be there. It's a personal preference kind of a thing. And again, you do see it more in kind of Pacific Northwest versus California West Coast. So um, it, it's just an interesting, very, very slight, slight difference. And I, I would kind of love to have it there. But I also love, and we'll probably get onto this in a minute, that it has food pairing burger, tacos, pizza. I'm like, it's like my favorite food groups are all <laughs> mentioned here. So again, I'm, I'm here for that. And funny because I've just looked at the can as well. And um, do you want to hear what hops are in this one? Oh, go on. We've got Columbus, Simcoe, Centennial, Strata, Amarillo, Chinook, and Nelson Salvin. Oh, because I feel like that's kind of a curveball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah, interesting. Now, as Lisa said, we wouldn't have this in judging. So there's no, yeah. we wouldn't be able to comment on something like this. And when you're judging a beer, you know, you can't um, say, oh, reduce the amount of Simcoe. Because right. you can't make the assumption that somebody's used it just because you're tasting a flavor that you associate with that hop. That's not something you can do as a judge. Mm-hmm. You know, what you can do is, you know, talk about the balance or talk about, you know, uh, lowering a resin and upping a fruity or something mm. like that you can you can talk vaguely about these kinds of things but the kinds of advice that you'd give to the brewer is much more usually around fermentation temperature mash temperature um yeast health mm. um you, you know you could be talking about um yeah ingredients uh, fresh ingredients fresh hops to avoid things like oxidation, yeah, that kind of stuff. You wouldn't be saying, you know, Nelson Salvin doesn't belong in an IPA. Right. You know, that's not the kind of feedback that you'd give as a judge because first you wouldn't know it and you definitely wouldn't assume it. But interestingly, there's also on here the malts. So we've got Carapils, Caramunic 2 and Dextrose. There oh, must be pale malt in there as well. Yeah. Oh, they've got pills. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, now here, again, like you said, we wouldn't have this. The malt bill is relatively simple, designed to balance the bitterness, which, again, it absolutely does. Um, and, and I know we've said this before, but, you know, we like to say, like, you know, none of this works without the malt being, you know, spot on. Like, it's about getting good malts. It's about really dialing that in. And that's no easy feat. I think we've all had things where it's wrong. Um, and certainly in a homebrew competition, people have whatever malt they've got around, right? So you can often have things where it's doing something strange to the color and maybe not to the flavor, or it's kind of unbalancing the flavor in a way that's not true to style. Um, or again, if you're a commercial brewer, hopefully you, you, you're getting what you want from the malts on purpose that because you, you've chosen them to do X or Y. So um, again, even if it's not necessarily correct in air quotes for style, you said, this is what we want these are the malts we used and here's why we think it's delicious. So it's a different, it, it's a different um, maths mm-hmm. really at the end of the day. Mm. Indeed. So then the last bit on the score sheet. Overall impression, which is again, exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what were your overall thoughts about the beer and how does this compare to the style? And if you note anything that you should change, if, if there's off flavors and you know, typically these off flavors come from a certain part of the brewing process, you might recommend, Hey, brewer, you know, this, I noticed these flavors. Sometimes it happens in this part. Maybe you want to check that or something like that, you know, helpful feedback that could help them avoid if there's problems or, hey, I really liked this. And, you know, I would prefer it if it had a little more X or a little less Y or no, it's great. Keep it as it is. So Hmm. those sorts of thoughts there, or you might want to say here, hey, the aroma matched the flavor. And I really liked that. Or, hey, you know, the aroma had this in it. And then I didn't get that in the flavor. And I really would have liked more of that. So those kind of things work really well in the overall impression. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as as a home brewer, you know, the overall impression is 
largely the most important part of that score sheet for you. You know, you might get obsessed over the actual score, but really the impressions are where the judge adds value to their work on evaluating your beer. Because as Christina said, you know, what they're linking is the flavors that they found or didn't find and any improvements that could be made to tweak or correct things. So if you have found diacetyl, the, the recommendation will always be do a diacetyl rest, check your yeast health. And, and you know, there's, a, there's sort of a, you know, if X, then Y1, Y2, Y3, sort of laundry list of things that you can do. But that's the value of, of judging is getting that feedback alongside the, this is actually a lovely beer, I would drink this daily, um, but it would be really hard to get that sort of feedback as in, this is great when your score was only 25 out of 50. So <laughs> most, and most brewers realistically are scoring in, you know, the upper twenties and early thirties. Yeah. That's the most common scores in a beer competition. Um, you know, your beer has to be quite bad or infected <laughs> for it to score much, much lower than 20. Um, and it has to be absolutely sublime with not one thing wrong not one improvement could be made for it to score even above 45 you know you don't you don't get many beers over 45 out of 50 in a beer competition and the reason that you don't get many 50s is because there's just no such thing as a perfect beer right right arguably <laughs> arguably and, and like you say most of the time the feedback you're giving is relatively not always but relatively basic it's around temperature it's around sanitation or it's around pretty key parts of the process it's not necessarily around like you said oh if you added you know this at an extra you know if you or if you dry hopped with x it, we don't know what you did you know like right. it's it's not something we can really comment on so it's it's really hard to be that specific but you can say very general things about you know heat you know sanitation the, the basics because that's really what's driving a lot of it or again the idea of is what you used accurate or, or appropriate for the style? It does, does this malt make sense? Does this yeast make sense? Those are things you can, you know, make yes. a change to. So you want to give people actionable feedback that they can actually say, oh, yeah, you're right. I was trying to make a Vienna lager, but, you know, whatever. I had something too light or something too dark, what, whatever it was, you know, it, it can be very broad, but then at least they know, oh, I'm on the right track. I just need to either enter this in a different category or, you know, make some minor adjustments to what I'm doing. Like, most of the time, you don't want to be like, don't, don't never do this again. Like, that's, that's not the kind of feedback you want to get. No, so. <laughs> no, no, no. Constructive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine, imagine you were the brewer receiving that feedback. How would you like to receive feedback? You know? If, yeah. exactly. For me, for me, if there's something really wrong, I try to find something good to to do that what you know yeah. what I learned when I was teaching the the the, the sandwich so yeah. good <laughs> bad, good so yeah. you know it can be I really liked the appearance I thought you know the appearance was to style and then you can say but everything else was bad yeah but you try really hard you know you you kind of you want to find something positive because the end goal is not to discourage people from right. brewing it's to get them to keep brewing it to come back so mm -hmm. them showing up full stop is amazing. Them 100%. entering their beers full stop is amazing. So you want to find positive things because they're only going to improve and you want to encourage them. So, you know, you don't want to be, you want to be honest because you have to give that feedback that helps people improve, but you don't want to be mean. And there's a yeah. difference um so always try to find positive things about and you can find positive things about every beer that I don't care how bad it is. There is something good about that beer. Yeah. And maybe someone has made something that is category defining. Maybe the category for it does not exist yet. You can say, wow, I love this. It's not this, but you know, great. Keep doing this yes. and maybe we'll find a category for it. Or mm -hmm. again, make this change to make it X. But sometimes you do get these things that are just phenomenally good and you don't know how to categorize it because that category yeah. just isn't there yet. So mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's there's a lot of this in beer competitions where the beer that's entered is an objectively excellent beer, but it's just been miscategorized. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's you, you know, they've entered an IPA uh, as in 21A, which is American IPA, but it's actually a hazy IPA, or they've entered a, um, 
you know, red IPA when really it's an amber ale, you know, and there's sometimes there's very subtle differences between these yeah. styles. And, you, you know, what, what people often do is they, they enter it into the category that they thought that they brewed. <laughs> and <laughs> we, we've said this a few times on the pod now, but if you're brewing and if you're going to enter a competition, please taste the beer first. Yes. <laughs> please make sure that it actually fits. Even if you've got a basic understanding of BJCP, just have your own taste of it. Decide whether it fits within that category or whether there's a better fit and look for the ones that seem similar. So red IPA, amber ale, these are quite similar. You know, red IPA and red ale, not that similar. So, yeah. you know, don't be deceived by, you know, terms like red, but, you know, look for the ones that are before and after and see whether there's a slightly better fit and then make the decision as to where to enter it. Because it's really tragic to get a great beer that could have been an award or a medal winning beer in another category having to be marked down. You know, you can't, you can't score the best score at that table or in that category if your beer is just miscategorized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what were your overall impressions then, Lisa, on, on your, on your idea? So my overall impressions, and again, this is, you know, had I looked at the front of the can more closely, um, West Coast IPA and on the can, there's a sunset, there's palm trees, you know, it's, this is very sort of, you know, San Diego or LA, you know, definitely that kind of West Coast IPA, which is great. Love it. Um, Again, for me, I prefer the Pacific Northwest ones that have a little bit more of this sticky, almost sweetness um, sometimes. Um, but again, in that case, we would see a Sasquatch. We would see, you know, <laughs> we would see fir trees and, and, and all sorts of things. We would see rain. Not seeing that, we're seeing the sun. We're seeing palm trees. So absolutely bang on for that. Like it's, it's your old school California, you know, West Coast IPA here for it because good Lord, we've seen so few of these lately. I would just like to have a little bit more bitterness at the end. Again, it's plenty bitter, but I'm just not perceiving it as much as I would like to. Um, but I think that's because I don't drink a lot of hazy things. So I think people who drink hazy things will think this is super bitter. So it goes back to that. But again, I think they've done an amazing job. It's a great beer. We'll definitely purchase again. Um, bang on for the style. So I, I think, you know, where we were we just doing that overall impression, we would be like classic example of the style. California version specifically. So there you go. I like how there's these different versions of West Coast IPAs because I, I don't think I'd have ever known. Very about slight that. nuance. Yeah. Mm. Very, very minor. And only like my own like weird quirk. So however, listeners, it, it doesn't mean that it's captured in the BJCP guidelines. So the BJCP no. in this case is just American IPA. And exactly. I mean, we've we've been using West Coast and American interchangeably. It's because West Coast IPA used to be the term. In the BJCP, it's American IPA. So, but they are the same thing. They're the, yeah. the clear, bitter ones, not the hazy, juicy ones. So in my case, um, look, even without reading the can, although definitely having read the can, this is <laughs> miscategorized. <laughs> now, it is a lovely beer. And actually, it's very impressive for the strength that it is, that it's captured... Um, the hop flavors, the hop bitterness, the malt backbone without the sweetness, I think that is brilliant. Um, so I really enjoy this beer. However, it is miscategorized um, because if it was entered as an American IPA, it, it's just too strong. You know, 10.5%, we're not even in double IPA territory, we're in triple IPA territory. <laughs> And by the way, there isn't actually a triple IPA category in BJCP. <laughs> um, I think they go into a whole other category of just extra strong beers that'll fuck you up. So uh, <laughs> beers so, that will fuck you up. I love that as a yes. category. Though. <laughs> yes, beers that'll fuck you up. <laughs> and not at all a comment on BJCP, but I got to I got to tell you, Western Herd, if you could have put triple IPA on the front, that would have helped a lot. Because it is sort of hidden at the back, but I didn't see that when I bought it. Anyway, but my other my other overall impressions were that beside it being, um, you know, ABV too high um, and that sort of alcohol warmth on the nose for me wasn't super welcome for an American IPA. For a double IPA or a triple IPA would have been more welcome. Um, I thought it could be slightly better or higher carbonated just to help elevate and lift it and keep it bright as opposed to you know, heavier. Um, and it is a heavy beer without the yeah, need to be sticky. So, but otherwise the, the balance and the complexity is great. 
and well done. That's awesome. And I think maybe one other thing I would add about, about the, the hope one again is, um, you know, seeing that it's 7.4%, which is, you know, very comfortably in the American, you know, range. Um, and the thing I forget whenever I go back and visit America and then I'm like, oh, I've had some beers and this is not what we get in Ireland where I'm used to having a beer that's maybe four and a half percent or five percent. But um, it, it, it just sort of struck me as funny because when I go to my, my local pub up the road and they have Handsome Jack on, which I think is like 6.4 percent also from Hope, people are always like, do you know it's very strong? And I'm like, <laughs> come I'm on, like, give me a break. We're good. <laughs> We're yeah. good. But I would say you do definitely notice that this, you know, the 7.4 here now, not like you're 10 something with, with the Western herd, which again, looking forward to, to trying, but I, I do think, you know, you, you do, you do notice that it's not, you know, hidden, but it's also not the most prominent thing you taste. Mm. And I think the other thing to note is it's just tastes quite different from handsome Jack. So it's not like we've just dialed up the handsome Jack recipe because I think that would be a very easy thing to do um because I love handsome jack it's a great it's great IPA but this is clearly a distinct different beer and we didn't just kind of you know cheat by doing the same thing but more if that Mm. makes sense so I do think that's again not something you would do judging in a competition but I like when you can compare a brewery's whole range and say oh this is unique this is not something they just do every week dialed to 11 it's just a different thing so well done for doing a proper proper one-off yeah that's great although one very very tiny and not at all significant criticism (laughs) of that hope one it being 75 ibu would technically put it out of the american IPA range yes no you're absolutely right yeah so the the ibu range for for this style of ipa is 40 to 70 now to be fair absolutely nobody on this earth is going to know the difference between 70 and 75 like, no. let's be real most people don't know the difference between 40 and 50 um or 20 and 12 so or, you know or 10 so it's really not a big deal but if you see this is another kind of like warning to brewers you know if you're going to put that sort of thing into your notes people should expect to taste it and you know hope the brewery or commercial breweries aside because they can do what they want if you're entering a bjcv competition don't offer this kind of information up right just um just don't <laughs> yeah yeah not, it, not for competition yeah it also can be confusing because there's perceived bitterness versus ibus Absolutely. so what you have is the ibus can be really high but if you're balancing out that with a lot of malt your perceived bitterness can be a lot lower what and so when people yeah. are judging this if they have the high ibus they might be thinking they're getting something that they're not getting like candy and lisa are saying because you balanced mm. it with the malt and that might sway them to judge one way or the other so don't don't provide that info. Yeah, don't give yeah. people uh, like something to knock you down with it. Like, you know, but, yes, but again, exactly. I love to have it on the can here. So I know roughly what I'm getting. Like you said, Tandy, I had the same thing when I bought the one you have, because that's why it's still sitting in my fridge, because I need an occasion to <laughs> to open it up. But again, I, I, I love that this is here. Um, but absolutely, like you say, the IBUs and the perceived bitterness are very different things, because this is definitely not as bitter tasting to me as some of those things in the early 2000s mm. that were, you know, redonkulous IBU for no reason. Mm-hmm. And that was the only flavor, flavor yep. you got, which we didn't need this, but, you know, we Pops had it. arms race. <laughs> yeah, we didn't need yeah. it. We didn't actually need a beer served out of like a stoat, which is also a thing that happened. Go look it up, kids, if you didn't live through that. But uh, yeah. <sighs> um, oh, but yes, is, I remember that. Yeah. I remember seeing it. <laughs> yeah. I, I had it. I had it at a place. It was... It was objectively not good, but <laughs> we are. <laughs> that's, very, that's very funny. Yeah, but so, yeah, don't offer information that you don't want to be graded on. Yeah. Um, and try and make sure that you taste your beer before you enter it so that you know which the better category is. Um, but otherwise, th- this, is, this has been quite fun. I mean, I, I love to judge beer. And even if we're not giving yeah. these scores, it's lovely to go through and um, just give a bit of an overview of what we're tasting in these beers absolutely yeah. and i think yeah oh go ahead yeah no i was just gonna say the other thing i want to say is if you taste your beer and you don't like it or you think that there's something wrong that doesn't mean don't enter into the competition yeah mm. because mm. it's literally like the job of judges to tell you especially if you don't know where did i go wrong definitely enter yeah. it because it's literally our job to to help 
It's free feedback um, or free ish yeah. feedback. Yeah. yeah. So by all means, if you taste it and there's off flavors and you're not sure where they're coming from, or if you just want to enter it anyway, you should. You absolutely should. So don't don't feel like, oh, I made this and oh, it's a bit shit. Mm. That means that you shouldn't enter it. You should enter it um, to get that. What you should be getting from judges is a score sheet completely filled top to bottom with all kinds of information, all kinds of data and things that you can help help you brew in the future. Um, mm. If 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 you have good judges, that's what they should be giving you. Um, not one word answers or one sentence or yeah. something like that. It should be completitely filled. So it's yeah. a great way to get that feedback so you can improve. 100%. Definitely. And if you did look into something where you have created a new category, well, get that feedback, find out, you know, it's, um, that can never be a bad thing. So, so like I say, unless you know, it's infected because of a thing you did, like, come on, at least try, get the feedback and, and find out because other people may love this weird thing you created. Like, like, come on, we, we don't think all these hazy things are here because people did that on purpose initially. We're, you know, come on, come on. Yeah. So, yeah. And at the same time, you know, take the beers to your local homebrew meets, yeah. you know, for initial, you know, initial kind of sense checks. Um, you know, they, they can help weed out some of the bigger issues. Um, there might be some BJCP judges within your homebrew club, mm -hmm. your nearest one, and they can often help weed things out. They also might encourage you to enter it because it's probably very good and you're probably underselling yourself. So yeah, yeah enter your beers and do the things and don't be, uh, yeah, don't be discouraged. Here, here. Well, friends, yeah, unless there is anything else in the BJCP score sheet and, and guidelines, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, but friends at home and listening, tell us whether you'd like to see a little more of this, you know, give us feedback this time. Um, so if we had to do something like this, where we we're comparing um, three different beers of the same style, according to the BJCP, maybe it's a brown ale or Maybe it's an amber ale, or maybe it's a dry stout. Who knows? Um, tell us what you'd like to see, or if there's a style you'd like us to taste according to the BJCP with some commercial examples, and we'll make it happen. And Unless it's Island's Edge. Don't make us do that. No. It would be funny. It would be funny. <laughs> it could be we very could, entertaining. We could do a bunch of, like, not great beer. Well, you know, to be <laughs> fair, though, we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we um, don't actually give those beers the attention that they deserve. If we were to judge those beers blindly, we'd have to actually give them that attention. So we, we probably will do a blind tasting at some point. So, folks, at some point that. we will. Yes. And if there's one that you think would be really funny, we're, we're here. Let us know. You know, that would make a great uh, live show concept. So if anybody wants to to do a beer ladies live <laughs> yeah well that, yeah we should do another one that first one's really fun we should indeed well anyway let's let's let all the people get back to their own beer tasting and for um those who want to see what the score sheets look like or learn how they work because there's different scores associated with each of the you know the categories of stuff that we filled in from aroma to flavor to mouthfeel we'll put a link into the show notes of the bjcp score sheet and we'll also link the bjcp style guidelines so that you can go and have a read through yourself and yeah send us your suggestions and your um yeah tell us what to do next and we'll do a bjcp review for you you're here all righty thank you christina thank you lisa and thank you to everybody listening at home we will see you all next week Goodbye. Bye.